The Biggest Mistakes We Made as Pre-Meds, brought to you by the medical school headquarters. What you're going to watch is a recording of a live webinar that we did with approximately 50 to 60 students on with us. And we're going to go through some slides of the biggest mistakes that Allison and I made as pre-meds and yet we still got into med school. And what we're trying to show you is that you don't have to be perfect. You just have to continue down the path that you'd set out on going down as a pre-med or as a non-traditional student, the, the goal of being a physician. And you just have to keep going down that path every day, keep doing something that leads you towards that goal. And we're going to cover some of the, the, the mistakes that we made, and we're going to talk about it. What you're going to notice, we had some technical difficulties with this live podcast. It was our, our live webinar. It was our first live webinar. And so, but that's just a, a brief moment. I hope you enjoy what you see here. If you have any other suggestions for mistakes that maybe you made as a pre-med, go ahead and leave them down below in the comment area. Let's get started. So who are we? So um, I am Ryan's wife, <laughs> and uh, I'm a practicing neurologist. Uh, a little bit about my background. Uh, I was born in the Boston, actually born in Ohio. I keep forgetting that, but uh, lived in um, Boston, grew up in the Boston area, and uh, went to McGill, actually, in uh, Montreal. I'm American, but I went to a Canadian um, school. And uh, then I took a year off between college and med school, uh, and then um, applied to medical school and went to New York Medical College, and actually that's where Ryan and I met. And uh, through uh, a bunch of different um, pathways, I, I ended up in neurology, and I can chat about that with um, anybody who's interested at some point, uh, but I really fell in love with neurology, so I did my residency at Mass General in Brigham. Uh, in Boston in adult neurology and actually just graduated uh, this past June. And so as of uh, just a few weeks ago, actually, I started at a practice uh, in the Boston area and I'm, uh, as we call them, tending now, um, uh, practicing in neurology. So uh, I'm loving it and it's been quite the journey. So uh, that's a little bit about me. And of course, if you guys have any questions, um, you know, about anything along either of our pathways, uh, please, of course, feel free to ask us. Awesome. So husband and wife duo. Uh, I think a lot of you know us from the podcast. Maybe some of you don't know us yet. But we have our little office in our house. We have some microphones and we talk to lots of cool people and record podcasts and give them out to you guys to help you on your journey. I think uh, I'll talk about me for a, a second. Uh, I am a flight surgeon in the Air Force, but tonight I'm talking as a non-Air Force person, non-active duty military person. This is just me as my, my side little hobby that I do. I also went to New York Medical College, obviously, as Allison uh, stated earlier. I went to University of Florida for undergrad, studied exercise physiology, was a personal trainer for several years in between undergrad and medical school, and and uh, then I applied to, to medical school and, and got in, and uh, we'll, we'll take you through our journey of kind of some of the mistakes that we made and... Uh, how you can uh, not make those same mistakes. One of the biggest questions we get a lot at, from talking to students is why exactly we're doing this. They're like, you're, you're doctors. Aren't you busy enough? Why are you doing this? Why are you helping us? And part of that reason is because when we were undergrad students, we had pretty bad pre-med advising. For me specifically, I remember walking into my advisor and being told, you're a white male, you shouldn't even apply to medical school. It was kind of horrendous. And it's still in, it still is horrendous. I think it's like 63% of uh, white males get into medical school or 60, yeah, some, some stat like that. And, and so I really had no guidance going through medical school. And 
as we continue to talk, you'll see some of the things that I did were a result of not having any uh, good pre-med advising. So at McGill, um, I had a terrible pre-med advisor, and not to be mean to her, but uh, she basically told me, um, you know, you need a backup plan. That was sort of the first thing out of her mouth when I said, hey, I'm interested in applying to medical school. She said, okay, what's your plan B? That was the first thing she said, and I was just kind of taken aback and uh, had such a, it was such a negative conversation. And I later learned that, um, you know, that has to do with how hard it is to actually get in for Canadian uh, students into Canadian medical schools. There's a kind of a lot of uh, bad blood about that. And I think uh, the advisor was just kind of embittered and trying to warn me, but I actually wasn't interested in applying to Canadian medical school. So it really didn't matter. Um, and I just, yeah, there was just a lack of advising in general that I really didn't know about before um, I got into wanting to apply. Yeah. And when I started working as a physician, I had a lot of younger people come up to me and ask me about the process. And when I would talk to them about it, they kind of looked at me very confused and <laughs> perplexed when I would go through the whole process and it would take a long time. And, and I started realizing exactly how crazy it is to figure out how to get to medical school. And I'm, uh, y you can see on the screen a, a image of the New York City subway map and that's what it feels like. You're, you're on a random subway trying to get to, to midtown Manhattan, and there's 40 billion different subway train uh, cars to get there. And for a lot of students out there, some of you who are listening now, it, you really don't have that, that trusted pre-med advisor to go to and that, that you're very confident in the answers that you're getting from him or her. So... That was another reason why we did it. Obviously, just saying, oh, we're doctors, we've been through it, doesn't really help. But I, I think with the experience that I'm getting, talking to a lot of the experts, I'm, I'm building on my knowledge to help you guys through the podcast and, and through everything else that we're doing. So that is why we're doing what we're doing. And we're having fun too. And the, the ultimate goal is to to get people into medical school. I, I think more physicians is great. Obviously, we need more room for medical students and more room for residents, but that's a, a whole different topic. But people that probably were too shy to get into medical school or thought they couldn't get into medical school who didn't even try applying, I, I'm hoping those few people do get into medical school and, and do well and, and treat their patients well. So that's why we're doing what we're doing. So one of the first big mistakes that I made specifically, and Allison can talk a little bit about it as well, is just knowing how everything fits together. There's, there are so many steps to the process. There's tests. There's getting letters of recommendation. There's knowing what type of school to apply to, whether you want to be an MD or DO uh, I, I know talking to a lot of people recently, they, they didn't even know you could apply to a, a DO school um, as they're submitting their applications. Uh, there's research that you maybe should or shouldn't do. There's primary applications, secondary applications. There's three application uh, bodies, one for the DO, one for the MD, one for Texas, because Texas is special and they want to be all by themselves. So they... When I first started this process, I just kind of went through it and said, oh, whatever, I'll, I'll just go through and I'll apply to be a doctor and I'll get into medical school. My, my path to undergrad was going to my high school advisor and saying, I want to apply to the University of Florida. She submitted an electronic application for me and that was it. So that's the, I was kind of used to just, okay, that's what I want to do, so let's do it. And without that pre-med advising that I had, I didn't really see how it all fit together. And so that's one of the goals that, that we have here at, at Medical School HQ is just trying to get everybody on the same page, letting everybody know what is out there for you to do, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. 
And some of you may be at schools where uh, you're lucky enough to have, uh, you know, great advising and committees and <clears throat> people who can really guide you along every step of the process, depending on, uh, you know, uh, how old you are, where you are in the process. But uh, for those who don't, and even for those who do, uh, online, you know, the interweb, the internet is is the way the world works nowadays. And there's what we've heard from so many people is just that it's so overwhelming and confusing and you don't know what information to trust, as Ryan was talking about. Um, and some websites that uh, people have gone to, uh, we've heard that, and, and we've seen this ourselves, that sometimes people just post things on the internet on certain websites to try to, it seems like they're trying to, uh, you know, throw somebody under the bus and, and give them bad advice or just really uh, kind of drag them down and make them feel like they have no chance to get in, you know, getting into medical school. So, um, you know, we're hoping to provide you guys with some really helpful advice to, to really make it, it a clear pathway so that you get what you need, different points in the timeline and the right information at the right time. Yeah. All right. So we're going to go move on to number two. And number two might seem it a little specific and a little weird. Why are we talking about Canada? And so this is maybe more for a student that is early on, maybe high schoolish, uh, trying to figure out where to go to undergrad. We get a lot of emails from students and questions asking, what's the best undergrad school to go to? And so Allison's going to talk for a second about her choice in undergrad. So why did I go to McGill? Just in brief, my upstairs neighbor had gone there. I knew it was a good school. It's in a great city, great science program. So there I went. Um, and uh, what I, again, learned a lot later was that uh, it's their, the the grading that they do at McGill there and, and potentially other Canadian medical, um, sorry, Canadian colleges, uh, it's not, there's no grade inflation. So uh, we had really very, very rigorous classes. They were all science um, and uh, they graded them pretty darn hard and <laughs> there wasn't a lot of curving either. So um, that was one thing. And uh, it, uh, I didn't realize until later on, people said to me, um, you know, a couple years later while I was well into college, they said, oh yeah, well, Canadian schools, you know, you tend to have lower GPAs when you come out and then you apply to medical school. And I said, oh, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> um, so that's one thing to, to know. The other thing about, um, Canada and potentially other schools, like if you go to an engineering school or, um, a, you know, a program that's very specific and, um, kind of has a narrow focus, uh, there, there weren't really distribution requirements. And what do I mean by that? Like those general classes that a lot of schools in the United States, uh, require you to take. So English and, you know, humanities and social studies and, uh, art history, all that kind of stuff. I didn't have to take one lick of that if I didn't want to. And I felt like I was going to forget how to speak English if I didn't take an English course at some point during college. So I did, and I, I took a class in history, et cetera. But anyway, that was, that was part of it. So I think, if you're in high school, you're looking at a school to choose, just be aware that there are some programs that are very rigorous and very um, specific. And then you just want to be aware that, you, you know, you, you do want to take English and other things as part of your application to medical school. All right. So one of the biggest things that we wanted to talk about with, with Canada and other schools is grade inflation. I think... Talking to Dr. Politis recently in one of the recent podcast episodes I did, we were talking about how Washington University is is a very tough pre med school, and and a three point five from Washington University might be like a three point seven from a different school, but I don't want you to get fixated on going to a tough pre-med school or or an easy pre-med school, you're going to get a good education. And one of the things you have to think about is if you get a lower grade point average, you might have a tougher time getting into school, in a medical school, and they might not see that you went to a tough pre-med school before they go down their list and, and invite everybody for an interview. So it's it's kind of a tough decision. We just wanted to bring it up so that you know that there there is a distinction there. Some schools are tough at, at grading. Some schools aren't. And, and so just knowing that uh, will be good. So I want to ask you guys. I can, I can see questions now uh, on a different screen. Uh, 
I want to know how many schools you guys think you are going to apply to. If you can type in your little box there. 15 from Jordan. He was on it. 10, Nicole, 5 to 10. 6, 9, at least 10. 20 from Eric. Nice. 20. 10 to 30. Oh, you're an old pre-med. Okay. <laughs> uh, so... The average is about 15 right now, and there's a good reason. Obviously, medical school is hard to get into. You always hear that 45% number thrown around, and and we can kind of debunk a little bit of that a little bit later, but we wanted to talk about applying to enough schools to make sure that you are kind of spreading your wings far enough and, and reaching the right people. Because I think too often you don't get enough schools applied to and you're limiting where you can possibly go to. And so that that's our, our number three is location, location, location. Trying to figure out where you want to go to medical school and where you're going to apply is a huge deal. And so... This one, again, is for for Allison because she has a a good story about her application. So when I uh, thought about applying to medical school, I thought that I wanted to stay in the Northeast. I grew up in the Northeast, in Boston. I uh, went to McGill in Montreal. I thought, okay, well, I want to be back in the United States and I want to get closer to home. I've always been real close to my family and I do love other parts of the country, don't get me wrong, but I just had this kind of fixation on going to to medical school in uh, the Northeast. And there are a ton of schools, um, you know, New York and in Massachusetts, so I figured, okay, that should be fine. And uh, I think initially I applied to 10 and then I added another four along the way. So I applied to a total of 14 schools, uh, but again, they were really restricted in, in that Northeast area. Uh, And when I think back now, um, much the wiser, um, I think that it could have been just a lot less stressful for me if I had broadened my horizons a little bit and realized that, you know, you're young, you're going to go to medical school, it doesn't matter so much where you go. Uh, and, and again, for me, it wasn't necessarily about a specific school. It was literally being like in that, you know, radius of the Northeast. So it was pretty silly, um, kind of short sighted. So I think I really, really highly recommend that you broaden your, your boundaries, you know, be open to, to living in another place. And it it could be a potentially awesome experience to, to try out another part of the country, uh, for a while. So I think one of the biggest reasons why people restrict maybe is because of in-state residency uh i i see me raw i don't know if that's a real name or a nickname but me raw wrote all the ones in texas nine and me raw is probably a texas resident um me raw can you say yes or no are you a texas resident but I'll let Mira know, Texas is actually the hardest to get into. I just ran some numbers, and Texas applications, 34% is is the acceptance rate in Texas, which is pretty low. So I I think you when you're applying to medical school, you you can't look at in-state, out-of-state residency. Yes, as an in-state resident applying to a state school, you might have a better shot. But if you're applying to an in-state school strictly for tuition purposes, you're severely limiting yourself. And I know it's it's scary to to see that Two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand dollar debt knocking on your door, and, and we have that debt, and it, it is kind of scary to look at, but it just it just sits there really <laughs> until you start working and paying it off, right? Yeah, and there are other ways of paying for medical school. Uh, you know, as Ryan did in the military, there are a lot of scholarships out there, not merit based necessarily, but. Um, there are programs where if you, you agree that you're going to, to be a provider, a physician in that state, in a rural community, then they can help you out with a scholarship. So, I mean, there are a lot of different things going on nowadays. So um, if finances are, are an, you know, an 
an issue, which I think they are for pretty much everybody, unless, you know, you're Bill Gates, um, there, there are a lot of ways of, of uh, dealing with the financial issue. So, yeah. And you're going into a field where you're going to get paid. So you're going to make a good income. You're going to have money. You're going to be able to pay it back. So the money should not be an issue, period, end of story. And I know that's kind of hard for maybe some people to hear that it's okay to have $200,000, $250,000 in debt, but you really can't uh, worry about that. I'm getting some people saying they can't see my slides. Is that true? So where were we? Talking about money, applying. Location. Mm -hmm. Apply broadly. The average is 15 for a reason because you need to apply to enough schools that match, number one, what you want to do. Uh, some schools have primary care specific missions nowadays. And if you want to be a surgeon, it might not be a good idea to apply to them. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with those kind of schools, and that's a whole different conversation. But you, you, when you're doing your research with the MSAR, which, again, I don't really like as a research tool, but it's the best that's out there right now, you need to figure out what the school's mission is. You need to figure out... Uh, where it is, you need to figure out whether or not you think you can see yourself fitting there. And obviously, you need to check the GPA and the MCAT scores to make sure that y you're in there. And and I know there's the, uh, the Lizzie M something equation where it's like MCAT plus or minus 4, GPA plus or minus plus 4 or 0.4, something like that. But there are a range of schools that will accept you. One of the biggest things I was recently talking to another person in a podcast was the fact that every school is trying to build a little community and they they aren't all looking for perfect 4.0, 3.9, um, 38 MCAT people. They They want a broad range of people. So you need to apply to a bunch of schools and maybe that one school that year is looking for somebody just like you. And and you're not going to know that if you restrict yourself. Yeah, Ryan and I were just at a conference for uh, pre-meds. And th there were several admissions officers there, from one from GW, one from Georgetown, one from Hopkins, and then um, another DO school uh, in Tennessee, and or a DO school, I should say, in Tennessee. And they all talked about that how, individually, how... Uh, it, they were interested in people who'd had really unique stories and it's not that cookie cutter, you know, checkoff list of, you know, the, the correct MCAT score to have and the correct GPA. They're looking for people who have a passion for medicine and from the clinical experience they've had. Uh, they're looking for people who are unique, who've had different life experiences and are going to add something different to their uh, medical school uh, community. Yeah. All right, so a lot of uh, a lot of people are asking questions right now. I'll we'll answer questions as they come in at the end. We have a, a lot of time for Q and A at the end, so if you hold off on a, a lot of the specific questions now, we'll get to what we can at the end. And this isn't too long, so bear with us for a couple more minutes. So the marshmallow test number four. We have the marshmallow test. If you haven't seen this YouTube video. Go find it. Not right now. Stay with us. But it's an awesome study that was done a while ago. And they followed these, these kids and found that kids that could delay gratification and not eat the one marshmallow that was in front of them and wait for two marshmallows that was promised to them if they didn't eat that first one, they, they studied these kids. The ones that could delay that gratification did much better in school later on. They did much better financially later on. And what we want to talk about here is how to say no to friends that are always pulling at you. Friends, family, other people that are pulling at you for attention when you need to be studying for the MCAT or studying for your next biology test, whatever it may be. 
going through the pre-med process, going through medical school, going through residency, you're going to be extremely busy. And sometimes friends that aren't going through that process with you aren't going to understand that. And so for me, I remember specifically, I was not able to delay that gratification. For the MCAT, I remember when I should have been studying for the MCAT, I was going out like a normal college kid. And I I remember going to a friend's house to pick him up and he comes to the door with his MCAT book in hand going, I can't go out, I'm studying for the MCAT. And I was the typical kind of peer pressure guy saying, oh, you don't have to study for the MCAT, it's not that important, you'll do fine. And lo and behold, he crushed the MCAT and I didn't do that well. So it it's one of those things, There's there's always another party to go to. There's always another movie to see with other friends. There's always another dinner to have with your your family. But you need to realize that whatever is most important to you, and if getting into medical school is important to you, then grades, MCAT, and all that should be one of your top priorities. Allison has a good story about delaying gratification too. Yeah, so I worked pretty hard in college, and um, that's what was demanded. It was the um, the way of McGill. Um, but I did get burned out at one point, and I remember in my junior year, uh, I got invited to go on this really awesome uh, trip to Europe, um, to Spain, actually. And uh, I knew that I had, I was taking an intermediate physiology course at that time. I, my major was in physiology, which is like human biology. Uh, and I had a, a, a big exam coming up for my course, but my trip was the next day. I was supposed to leave that next day and I knew I had to pack and I had started studying at some point, but it just uh, crept up on me really fast. And I was really focused on how excited I was to go on this trip. And so instead of doing what I knew I needed to do, which was take the time um, every day to, to really put in that time to study for this one exam, I didn't. I sort of breezed through the material and just told myself, oh, it'll be fine. Yeah, I bombed it. So I had, I think, a 43% on that. And that was the lowest test score I'd ever had in college. And I was embarrassed and mortified. And oh, my God, I didn't know what was. I remember crying in the quad and telling my mother I didn't know what was going to happen um, with the rest of my life. <laughs> anyway, it obviously all went, went OK in the end. But... <laughs> In one of my medical school uh, interviews, uh, I uh, actually someone who I was sitting across from pulled up my record, my transcript, and in that class, so I, like I said, I got a 43% on that one exam. Well, it was a big part of the grade. I saved myself with the the rest of um, that that year and or that semester was able to pull off a C plus in the course. But you know, a C plus is not so great when the rest of everything else looks great. Um, and, you know, it's it's not to say you can't get that kind of a grade and get into medical school. Obviously, I did. But uh, if my my um, the person interviewing me literally looked at my transcript and looked at me and said, you know, it seems as though you had a bit of a kind of slump in your junior spring semester. What happened there? So literally like pinned it right on the head there. I had to answer that. And so I, I took it as uh, I basically uh, tried to spin the question and, and say, well, you know, I, I looked at that as a learning opportunity and. Uh, you know, I, I obviously I didn't do what I needed to do to, to do well in that test. And I, my priorities weren't in the right place, but it, I mean, really it was a choice that I made at the time and I did not delay the gratification as Ryan talked about. Um, my grade showed, I got asked about it at an interview and it, it may have cost me admission to that school. Uh, did it matter in the end? No, but could something like that have mattered and could it matter for any of you? I mean, sure. So it's so important to have balance so you don't get burned out and so important to just keep always in mind that you're reaching for something far more important and far beyond, you know, the 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 night out to the bar or the trip to Spain. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So, we have another poll for you guys. Speaking of MCAT s- scores and grades, what do you think is a competitive MCAT score? A 30. Everybody likes that 30. Ryan says a 30. So, 31, 30, 35, holy moly. Yeah, that's super competitive. Of course, an anesthesiologist would say that. Anyway, um, so I, 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 I ran the numbers. I love running numbers and actually looking at statistics because it's the data that tells the truth, right? Not a pre-med student that says, this is what I read on Student Doctor Network. 
If you score less than a 27 on the MCAT, your chance of getting into medical school based on the last three years is 16.5%. And this is for MD. The, the DO schools don't break down the numbers as well, so this is MD only. Less than a 27, 16.5% getting into medical school. That's why we always harp on the M, respecting the MCAT. It's a, a hard test that is very important, and you, you need to do it. Do well on it. If you score above a 27, your chance of getting into medical school, 60%. It goes from 16.5% less than a 27 to 60% greater than 27. Everybody likes to throw out the 30 number. Greater than 30, 68%. Greater than 33, if you score 33 or greater, your chances of getting into medical school, 76%. So 33 would be a great number to aim for. It's a very hard number to get. If you get better than a 27 you're, 27 or, or better, you're going to do okay. I, I think uh, you have a good GPA, good MCAT score. Getting a, a 27 isn't the end of the world. I got a 27, I got into medical school, I'm a doctor, look at me now. So it's not impossible, but you have to, you have to obviously have that well-rounded application as well, including the GPA. So I want, let's talk about the MCAT. That was probably my biggest misstep in medical school is studying for the MCAT. Um, Lenise, I think that's how you say her name, said it's the devil. <laughs> it is the devil. I call the MCAT the devil, so we're on the same page. It, the MCAT is a once-in-a-lifetime test. You'll never see anything like, like it before. You'll never see anything like it after. So respect it the first time you take it. If somebody wants to know what Allison got. Oh. <laughs> I got a 31. Yeah, so Allison got a 31. She did well. And I'll hold it over him for the rest of his life. <laughs> but it... And and this is the kind of the the picture the the story we like to tell. She got a thirty one. I got a twenty seven. We're both physicians. No, our our patients don't come in asking. Um, what did you get on the MCAT before before you before you do a physical exam on me? What'd you get on the MCAT? <laughs> right. ha, have any of your patients asked you that? No, my some of my patients uh, have asked where did you do your residency. That's a common thing that people will ask. But um, yeah, nobody or they'll ask where did you go to medical school. I think more because people are just interested in that kind of thing, but certainly not scores. <clears throat> yeah. So the MCAT, I think a lot of people study improperly for it, and there was a big study that came out in 2008 that I wanted to share with you guys to, to actually show for those who haven't taken it yet or for those that are planning to retake it, maybe the, the retakers may be where you went wrong. I think the majority of people try to study for the knowledge part of the questions. They go through and they, they learn all of the formulas and they 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 study all the chemical reactions and that's what they learn they go back and and go through their their classwork material and learn all of that and the AAMC does put out a huge list of stuff that you need to know and I, I, I was talking to one student the other day who said he went through that whole list and made sure he knew everything on that list the problem is that compared to the GRE compared to the SAT compared to medical school classes, this study found that the MCAT had the least, the least, the lowest number of knowledge level questions. So all of that time studying the, the content specific stuff, the, the chemical reactions, the everything we just talked about, the equations, all of that time spent studying that was probably wasted time. I like to say that the MCAT is a test to see how well you can take tests, and specifically the MCAT. It, it's a test that requires you to take a lot, a lot, a lot of practice questions. 
and practice tests. And not practice tests like you do a couple questions here and a couple questions there, and then you figure out your score and, and you go, okay, that's what I got. To, to study for the MCAT, you need to sit down on the same time that you're going to take the real one. If it's an 8 o'clock test, you're going to sit down at 8 o'clock and sit for five straight hours and do that practice test and see how you do and get yourself in that rhythm. For athletes out there listening, you'll know. Practice makes perfect, and you have to practice in the same situation that you're going to be playing in. So it's super important. you have any uh, thoughts on that, Allison, about studying like that? Yeah, I echo everything you said. I uh, I did take a class. Um, I... Gosh, I'm trying to think now. I like I said, I took a year between college and med school, and I think I took the uh, the MCAT during that year. But um, I decided in the end to take a class, just a prep course. I think I chose Kaplan, and uh, it was good. I mean, it was helpful. I think it just gave that that structured framework. It was probably expensive. I don't remember anymore, uh, but it was worth it mainly because of those practice tests it gave me. So I remember doing a couple of them and it was like the real thing and it, it helped. Yeah. Lots of practice tests. All right. So I want to leave some time for some Q and a, so we're going to go somewhat quicker through these last couple. W- one thing I want to mention quickly about interviews, how to prepare for interviews You need to know the school that you're applying to, know their mission, make sure that you can talk about why you want to specifically go to that school because of what their mission or their location or research they have going on there. And because you're going to get asked that question likely, why do you want to go here? And why do you think you would be a good fit for our school, which is, you know, annoying, but they ask it. Yeah. And then the other reason to do research on the schools is so that you can formulate questions. You have to be able to ask questions when the interviewer goes, so do you have any questions for me? I went, when I went through the interview process, I had no clue what to ask. And I think I probably blew my interviews on, on that question. So it's important to, to have a, a list of questions that you want to ask. And you don't need to ask the same question to every school. Make sure you're asking um, school-specific questions to that school. You can ask opinion questions. You can ask the interviewer, what do you think about XYZ about that school, and and get their opinion. That's okay. But uh, be prepared to ask some questions. And one of the best advice uh, that I heard from an expert interviewer was just have a portfolio. As soon as you are applying to a school... Write down everything, do your research, have a list, uh, uh, like a sheet of paper for each school so you can research it and and take all your notes there. So that's uh, interview preparation. The last thing before we get to some Q&A is know where you are. I always talk about how having to figure out where you are so you can correct what mistakes you're making. If you're doing poorly in a class, you need to know why you're doing poorly. Know where you are so that you know where you want to go. Obviously, in the, in the world of GPS, you plug in the destination. Things still need to know where you are to give you directions. So if you're doing poorly, figure out why you're doing poorly. Correct course get back on course, and, and typically that will involve going and asking for help. Your school probably has resources for tutoring um, and pre-med advisors, obviously, to ask for help. So that's a, a big thing to know. you have any uh, thing about correcting course or knowing where you are, Allison? Just that it's a long process, and, you know, this whole talk is about mistakes you can make along the way, and uh, you know, we've we've made mistakes. We're doing what we're doing now. And, and don't get down on yourself if you do have a bad test or even a bad grade on your transcript. If you have that passion and you want it so badly that you're going to do whatever it takes, you'll get there. So uh, don't beat yourself up too much along the way. Yes. All right. So 
Before we get to some Q&A, we want to briefly mention something that we're excited to talk about. And this is the first time we're talking about it. We're going to be launching a membership site at Medical School HQ called the Academy, the MS, MSHQ Academy. It came from talking to many students out there about their experiences with what resources are available. And we have found that the majority of people out there don't like the resources that are available because they really can't trust them. And they, they search for answers and they can't trust any of the answers that are out, that are out there. So we're going to be opening up a membership site that we want to create a nice community of people that want to help others. Uh, obviously, we're going to be part of it. We're going to be monitoring things, answering questions, bringing in experts, having webinars that will go more smoothly than this one. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we're really excited. So we're going to have a form that's non-anonymous. You can't hide behind a username, so you can't uh, throw people under the bus and, and run and hide behind your username. It's going to be moderated, so topics stay uh, in check. And we're going to start building some teamwork. I think that's a big thing with healthcare these days. You have to have teamwork because medicine is practice in teams. The monthly webinars I talked about. In, in May, we'll probably have a webinar about applications because that's application time. In December and January, we'll have a webinar about the MCAT and MCAT tips because that's when people are start, starting to ramp up for the MCAT. Just lots of things like that. So we're going to be launching it soon, hopefully in the next couple weeks, maybe a little bit longer if we have some technical difficulties. But you can sign up to get on the list at jointheacademy.net. If you go there, it'll bring you to a page, and you can scroll down and uh, get your name on the list. So with that said, I want to answer some questions. I think... Uh, the first one that popped up here, how long before taking the MCAT should you start studying by Ryan? I think a minimum, it, depending on if you're doing it full time, if you, if you have time to just study for the MCAT, that's it. A minimum of two months. If, if you're doing other things, then you may need to spread that out because you're not going to have time to fit it all in. And again, most of that studying is taking tests. So mm -hmm. how long did you study for, Allison? I think about two months. It was over a summer period, so uh, and about two months. And however long that time ends up being, take the test, but also just keep doing what you're doing consistently. So try not to have any big breaks uh, when you're working or you're in school at the same time, it's hard, but try not to take any big breaks where you're not doing any questions or not looking at it at all uh, because it'll, you'll get out of that habit and out of that stamina of, of, of being able to do lots of questions. Yeah. Um, do prep courses work and which do you suggest? So they do. I mean, I know people who significantly improve their score. Um, I think it takes two to tango, which is a lame saying, but it's true because if if you're just relying on the prep course to do it for you, it's not going to work. Um, you know, you have to uh, obviously be really invested in it and, and um, it's, you know, do everything you can with them. But uh, I have seen people improve their scores significantly after taking a prep course. Yeah. And I took Kaplan as did Allison, I think you said earlier, mm -hmm. for for my MCAT testing. And for one of the podcasts, I talked to Princeton Review. And uh, I'm talking about all these podcasts. If you, if you haven't seen any of the podcasts, go to medicalschoolhq.net slash podcast list, and it'll, it'll bring you up a list of all the podcasts we've done. But one of the things that came up during the interview with the Princeton Review is the fact that Princeton Review uses multiple instructors per course. So they'll have one instructor teaching one subject, another instructor teaching another subject. And I think that's beneficial for some people. I had one instructor. I didn't like him. He wasn't a good instructor. And that kind of blew my whole course. So just yeah, so the, the answer is yes, they do work, but you have to put the work in um, and there are multiple companies out there so do your research and figure out which one is best for you there's some that'll do online only there's some that uh, have the courses 
uh, live in person in a classroom, but figure out what type of teaching environment you want. So, um, let's see. In order to afford my Bachelor of Science without debt, should I move overseas? I think the, the answer is no. It's it's very hard to... It, it's complicated to get into medical school as a foreign grad. Period. End of story. You might still be a citizen. That might help. Um, but that's very school specific. So look into that. Um, I don't have too much... Uh, experience with that. Maybe we can talk offline. Uh, Matthew's asking, should you AP out of biology or not? Oh, that's a good one. I can talk about that. Um, I took a lot of AP courses in high school and I I took none. Yeah. Well, gee, uh, and we ended up in the same spot. uh, Whatever. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I did take AP bio. Uh, I loved it. That was part of reaffirming why I was going to want to go to be, to do medical school one day. Anyway, um, I, I did very well in it. So I was able to, um, whatever the word is, get out of taking it in college, which was nice because I had to take physics and chemistry and, you know, all the other stuff um, that McGill wanted in that first semester. But uh, I did. It, it was fine. I mean, it actually freed for me. It freed up uh, an elective that so I was able to take, I think, Greek mythology, which was a nice break from all the physics and chemistry and calculus I was taking. Um, so I think it, it, the nowadays schools look at that fine. Um, the, you know, you, you probably should look into that because there might be some schools that uh, might look at it differently. But I think for the most part nowadays, and, and again, I applied um, a bunch of years ago, but uh, they, they look at that as, as equal and just fine. Awesome. The, the one caveat to that, if you AP out of a course is whether or not you'll know enough of the material for the MCAT. Right, and that just goes back to, again, no matter where, when and where you learned the material, you're going to have to review it separately when it gets to the MCAT time. So I definitely had to brush up on bio uh, because I had not had it since high school. And I think even if I had, you know, it just, again, you're going to want to go through all that material again. Yeah. Um, let's see. What were your GPAs? People are asking some very personal (laughs) questions. I think mine was like a three, seven, two or three, I think. And I was somewhere around there. I, I'm not lying guys. I honestly cannot remember. And the question has come up a whole mess of times during this whole journey we've been on with medical school HQ. I literally cannot remember my GPA. I just don't remember it. Uh, I remember a lot of other stuff about college and my application, but I just don't remember. It was it was somewhere. I think it was a little a little bit lower than Ryan's. Um, and again, because at McGill it was a very rigorous program. I was taking integrative neuroscience and intermediate physiology and advanced endocrinology. These were literally the names of my classes. I, it was crazy. <laughs> it was great because it prepared me really well for medical school. But seriously, seriously so, rigorous. So I have your uh, AMCAS application in front of me. <laughs> I, I found it today <laughs> so I could have it. Hope you guys enjoy this. Her, um, let's see, her BCPM, which is biology, chemistry, <laughs> physics, and math. I love how we're going to hear this at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> you had a 3.45. No, I didn't. Yes. Wow. See? Yeah. Look at that. All others, 3.82. Okay. So non-science, 3.82. Your BCPM, 3.45. Okay. And that intermediate physiology grade that I told you guys about didn't help, but... John <clears throat> John Fiddle says, ha ha. <laughs> well, thanks, John, but I hey. crushed you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, so, so your total was 3.54. That's right. Okay. You're, you're cumulative. All right. And again, you know, John, are you going to a school that asks you to take integrative neuroscience and advanced endocrinology? <laughs> Potentially not. So I do tend to hold my nose up. But, you know, it's just, again, because my GPA was lower than I thought it would be when I went to when I, you know. Excuses. Whatever. So, so my, <laughs> I have my AMCAS application here, too. I found it today. My BCPM, 3.78. Yeah, but you went to UF, you know. University of Florida, go Gators. Mm-hmm. One of the uh, best <laughs> undergrad um, edu- education-wise and sports-wise. It's not the Harvard of Canada. So. Okay, so let's get back to some questions. <laughs> so you, got, you see where you guys started? Ryan says a little tension there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, how do you begin to write a personal statement by Jordan? Yes. That's a great question. Yes. 
That's the answer. Yes. No. You begin. <laughs> you begin. But really, I think the best way to begin is thinking about your clinical experience. And when you guys do your clinical experience, uh, because you definitely need to do that to know even if you want to, to be a doctor, to know what it is, what do we do, what is this professional about, take notes, um, keep a mental log or a written log of what you do during your clinical experience, because it's that that you can draw from, th- those specific patient encounters that really moved you or touched you. Um, you can draw from those when you're writing your personal statement. Uh, people love reading stories instead of just boring kind of, you know, prose. Um, so being able to pick out a specific patient and talk about that and how that really made you want to become a doctor someday and, and help other people and, and yada yada. So that's, I think, a crucial key point. And that's what they're looking for, too, is, is mm-hmm. why do you want to be a doctor? You know, what, what experiences have made it that you want to be a doctor? So the suggestion on starting to write, yes, you need to talk about that kind of stuff, but don't edit in your mind. Write it all out on paper. Write it all out on the computer just start writing get it all out of your head and then start editing from there yeah that's a very good point all right um can you guys still hear us i got somebody to say they can't hear yes okay lots of yeses um it's nine o'clock now if this uh thing's gonna let me keep going i'll keep going is uh for a couple more minutes if allison has some time yeah all right. Allison's studying for her board, so she's taking some time out of studying for. Yeah. So <laughs> let it be known that when you take the MCAT, it's like the worst test you'll ever take. But uh, it's good in a sense because you'll be taking tests for the rest of your life. We would call ourselves professional test takers in medical school. And when you complete everything and you're done with your residency, your fellowship, you have to take your boards and whatever you've specialized in. So uh, I'm trying to look at this question here from Rachel. I'm an exercise science major at an SEC school. If it's not University of Florida, then I'm not going to answer your question. <laughs> I'll answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think going to such a huge school helps with any part of the application or interview process, or does going to a school with a party school football reputation, uh, is it detrimental? It, it has no bearing if, it, if you go to a party school or not. As long as you get the grades that you need, the MCAT score that you need, um, they, I'll tell you one one thing that may be det- detrimental going to a big school that that I experienced was just the advising that you get. You're you're going to be one of many pre med students that an advisor has to keep track of. So you have to do a good job of making the advisor know you. And also not just the advisor, because again, you know, there are other resources out there that that you can get information for about applying to medical school, but it's your classes, your instructors in the classroom who you got, you have to find a way to build a relationship with them so that when they write your letters of recommendation, they don't just think you're like number 236 in the physics classroom of 700. Um, And I found that challenging at McGill because I I had my general chemistry class was 760 people or something like that. And so I had to really, I mean, how the hell do you make yourself known in that environment? But you figure out a way and and get your letters of rec. So that's probably the more challenging piece of it, but it can be done. Um, Let's see. And I'm sorry if I don't answer all the questions. Uh, I'm trying to answer ones that I think will be helpful for everybody. If I don't answer one of your questions, you can email me on the side, ryan at medicalschoolhq.net. Or allison at medicalschoolhq.net if you don't want to talk to Ryan. Or or Allison, yeah. (laughs) I have better answers, obviously. I got a better GPA. (laughs) You got a better MCAT, though, so that's all right. Anyway, so what if I'm a bad test taker? Should I still try a pre-med track? Yeah, I think so. And part of uh, what may help is taking a class, uh, taking practice tests um, over and over and over again. I've met a lot of people along the way who are doctors, uh, lawyers who have who are, have told themselves and, and known for a long time that there are bad test takers and they're practicing attorneys and practicing physicians. So um, I think don't let that stop you. If you've succeeded academically in school and it, it, you know gotten good grades, um, You'll you can figure out a way to get through the MCAT. You can. Um, it's saying Ryan, could you speak a little bit louder? I'll try. Uh, Jessica, let's see. Let me see if I can find a question that you asked. Um, 
Jessica says she's interested in neurology. Cool, yeah. And perhaps aerospace medicine. So she's sucking up already. She's saying she wants to do what both of us want to do. Could you talk a little bit about a day in the life of a neurologist? Absolutely. Uh, I absolutely love my job. Neurology, nerd. yeah, whatever. I've always been a nerd. I've always loved school. I've, I'm one of those weird people that like studying and taking tests, which Ryan makes fun of me about forever. Uh, so in neurology, uh, I take care of people who've had strokes, uh, by the way, neurology is both inpatient and outpatient. So I've done a lot of inpatient neurology and residency. And, and it's different than neurosurgery. Yes. Very important cl- clarification. Um, so neuro neurology is diagnostic, uh, neurology. You're, you, uh, you take a history, you examine a person, there are different tests that we do and you, f- you figure out, uh, using your brain, what's wrong with their brain or spinal cord or nerves. Um, Neurosurgeons are people who actually operate on the brain and uh, they do a lot, like something like 26 or 27 uh, procedures all day, every day, um, whether it's on the brain or the spine. So very, very different. Um, And in neurology, like I said, we take care of people with strokes, migraines, Alzheimer's, ALS, Parkinson's, um, brain tumors, uh, peripheral neuropathy, spinal cord problems. It's an an incredible field. There's so much variety, and uh, I love what I do. If anybody's ever interested, I could talk forever about it. Yes. And as a flight surgeon, I'm basically a family practitioner for pilots and other people that work on planes. Being a flight surgeon, I'm also involved with occupational health stuff, public health stuff. Next week, I'm actually going to San Antonio for a public health emergency officer course, which is pretty interesting. So if there's an outbreak of some disease on the base, then I'm the one that kind of runs a lot of the stuff and, and answers questions. So it's uh, it's very interesting. Um, I'm going to try something if you guys would like me to try. If uh, I'm, I might try to unmute somebody and they can ask a question live. Let's see. You guys want to try to do that? Say yes or no. Yes or no. Sure. Yes, please. Uh, all right. Cassidy said yes, please. So let's see uh, if I can find her on this list and unmute her and she can ask a question. All right, Cassidy is unmuted. Hi. 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 I'm a, I'm a guy, though. Oh, you're a guy. All right. I'm a guy. I'm a guy. <laughs> what's your question? Hey, oh, what's your question? I was wondering, I'm really interested in doing the military, and specifically the Air Force. I've heard a lot about surgeons in Germany, but I don't know if that's just a big thing in the sky people go after. It doesn't really happen. So what do you mean surgeons, surgeons in, Germany? in Germany? Like I heard there's a big hospital in Germany that they fly people out to from the uh, Middle East. Okay. So traveling that way. Awesome. I'll mute awesome. you and I'll answer, your you answer your question. Cool. So the military, the army specifically has a huge hospital at Landstuhl and typically uh, with our our soldiers getting injured in Iraq and Afghanistan, they are uh, med flighted to um, to Germany. That's the 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 base they get to at Launchstuhl. They are seen by a critical care team there, just like a normal hospital here, getting a gunshot victim from an ambulance, and and they go from there. And then from Launchstuhl, they're stabilized and then sent back to the states. The problem with Launchstool is now that Iraq and Afghanistan are winding down, Launchstool is losing their level one trauma center certification. It's the only level one trauma center outside of the United States. So it's kind of interesting. But with the, the war winding down, thankfully, that's kind of going away. So it's, it's cool to be a surgeon in the military because you get a ton of experience that you normally wouldn't get as a civilian. And... And we live in Boston, and so with the re- recent bombings here, a lot of the surgeons that operated on victims talked about their experience working in a in a war environment for the military. And, and they weren't necessarily military surgeons, but they had volunteered their time to operate on, on soldiers and, and see that kind of stuff. So it's great experience. Um, let's see. I think you can raise your hand to ask a question. John Fiddle, let me unmute you. 
John. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, John. Hey, thanks for uh, putting this on, guys. Uh, my question was about the military medicine in general, what are the kind of pros and cons, and some of the rumors I've, I've read online about you know nurses being in charge and just kind of different things about that. I never know what to, to believe or not. Can you just kind of give the general experience what military medicine is like? Yeah, I'll talk about it. So that seems to be <laughs> like the physician's worst nightmare, the nurse is in charge. And you will find, I think, at a lot of places, a, a nurse is the officer that is in charge. Um, I don't have a problem with it, but some physicians do. They're not necessarily in charge of you, of your practice, but they're just in charge of the normal military structure, of, of the day-to-day military stuff. But they're not, they're not overseeing your practice. So I, I don't really know... Um, how to better answer that. Well, one thing also Ryan's talked about is how he considers himself an officer in, in the Air Force first and a doctor second, which is obviously different for me as a civilian. And so what I see as, as a civilian, you know, observing him when I've been when uh, visiting him at work, you know, they have that whole hierarchical structure of uh, officers, of majors and captains, et cetera. Um, and they it doesn't you know, what you do, like in the rest of your job as a nurse or a doctor doesn't matter as much kind of when when they're thinking in that way. But when Ryan goes and sees patients, he's Dr. Gray. So, you know, it's um, it's it's a little bit of like a, a disconnect that that actually works well. So I don't think um, anybody that Ryan's talked to has ever, and I've never heard him complain. And sometimes he just hasn't particularly liked the person who <laughs> happens to be the nurse, but it's not really because like he feels like anybody is telling him how to practice or is like, you know, over his head or something. Yeah. So hopefully that answers it. it there, there are some weird dynamics, but it's, it's a good experience overall. I like it. And I can talk a lot more specifics about military medicine uh, another time. I, I know I need to have a podcast about what I do and, and what I think. Um, I try not to give a lot of a, my own opinion because I think other people's stories are, are better than just talking about my opinion. But I'm going to unmute Nicole Pagluso. And I'm sorry if I butcher people's names. So, Nicole, be ready to be unmuted. Hi, Nicole. No, Nicole. All right. Um, there was another question here about um, letters of recommendation and committee letters. Committee letters, if you go to a school that offers committee letters, the medical school, if you don't get a committee letter, is going to wonder why you didn't get one. Did, did the committee not know you well enough? Were you not engaged with them? There's um, uh, a lot of questions behind that. Some committees won't accept you if your grades or scores aren't good enough, and I don't understand the, the gist behind that. But committee letters are, are kind of one of those necessary evils. If, if you have a committee, then work hard to, to get a good committee letter. We do know of people who've applied outside of that, still obviously from a college, but without that committee letter because they they weren't uh, they were told that their scores or whatnot were too low. So it's doable, but yeah, I mean, you you almost certainly will get asked, you know, well, why didn't you bring a committee letter? All right, uh, Gabby Mayer saying unmute me. So let me find Gabby in my list here, uh, and we'll go for a couple more minutes, guys. It's getting late. Uh, I don't want to keep you all night. So, Gabby, can you hear me? Yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, so, my question has to do with, I'm looking more at schools, um, sort of based on staying close to my family. And I'm curious, in New York City especially, which is where my family's from, there's a really high competition level of school. And I'm wondering, at what point can I say, okay, I'm going to get a great education. I don't have to worry about looking at, you know, the top 10 schools in the nation. So, um, where do I draw the line? Well, and what won't. Sorry, I missed the last F- of it. Finish that. What? Where would you draw the line? In terms of, you know, you can look, but you can look based on rankings at great med schools. Mm-hmm. But I, I think, as Allison was saying earlier, at most schools you're going to get um, a great education. And I'm wondering, besides rankings, how can you look at a school and say this place is going to give me what I need to be a great doctor? 
So I think it's, yes, rankings you can look at, but also what is the nature of what the school is about? So if you're someone who knows uh, in your bones that you want to be an orthopedic surgeon, that's the only thing that you could ever imagine doing, or you want to do something like ophthalmology, um, something that's kind of competitive, you may want to think about going to a place that's a, um, a more of a, has a, res- a big research uh, feel to it, a big major medical center, rather than a medical school that's affiliated with, um, you know, a small community hospital or that's quite rural. Um, because that, that stuff does play in later on when you apply for residency. But, uh, also just what Ryan alluded to earlier, you know, if you're someone who, uh, wants to do something, you know, like those fields and the school you're going to, uh, or the school that you're looking at is really primary care focused. I mean, there are some schools that, that literally just are completely into, we want to, to try to help with the primary care deficit in this country and, and pump out as many primary care physicians as possible. So knowing that ahead of time is going to help you become the kind of doctor that you want to be down the line. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, rankings, yeah, look at them, but like New York city, where you said you're from, uh, there, that's one great thing if you want to stay near your family, because I think New York City must, or New York State, I mean, they have probably more medical schools than almost any state in the country, maybe except California, and Ryan will correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I wouldn't, you know, worry too much about, like, which school in New York versus another one, you know, across town. I mean, literally, like, I we're not kidding. I mean, when you go to medical school, you're going to get a good education, and uh, you'll, you can get into really tough residency programs from schools that are maybe not quite as competitive as, you know, um, looking at a ranking list. So, um, so yeah. Yeah. If, if you look at the residents of a residency program, you're going to see the residents are from a broad range of medical schools. So don't get caught up in rankings. I, I know students love to rank schools and, and there's top tier schools and middle tier schools and lower tier tier schools, but you can do whatever you want, getting the education you need at any school. Honestly, yeah, you, you just you need to you have to do well in school again, and you know get good scores on the USMLE, which is that next test later on. And I'm an example of that. I mean, I went to New York Medical College, which is a great medical school, but it's not in that top top tier of Ivy League medical schools. And I got into one of the the top neurology residency programs in the country through Harvard at Mass General. So you can make it happen and uh, and do what you want to do where you want to do it. All right, it's nine. 16 now folks i think we're gonna wrap it up i um and super excited that you guys joined us thank you all for taking the time i'm sorry we had some technical difficulties at the beginning uh hopefully we made up for it in the end feel free to email us uh, and ask us questions please give us your feedback too we'd love to hear from you about uh how this was helpful to you in what ways and um and what other questions you have Suggestions for podcasts, if you listen to our podcasts, uh, I'm always looking for new topics. If you think you're a student out there that has an awesome story and wants to tell it on the podcast, let me know. Um, I'm always looking for interesting stories to talk about on the podcast. Please go to jointheacademy.net. Sign up to get on the waiting list for our our site. The kind of stuff that you saw tonight will be interesting. even better, I think, in the membership site because just we love sharing stuff. Uh, we love bringing you information that will help you get into medical school. So I'm getting lots of thank yous, um, and that's great. Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure. All right. We're out.